Respected members of the Sangha, led by Venerable Than Jao Kun Pra Meti Vachara Bandit, Director of IBSC, Professor Sorat Hong Radarom, President of the Philosophy and Religion Society of Thailand. Member of the society, professors, colleagues of IBSC, and my students, I would like to express my appreciation to the philosophy and society of Thailand to choose the venue of the annual meeting. Of the society this year, as IBSC, uh, in collaboration with the IBSC, which uh, recruit international students to study here in the field of philosophy and religion, we will broaden, help broaden the prospect of philosophy. And let it just study in Thailand to interest them and make them acquainted with what with uh, with what we have been doing in other universities in the fields of philosophy and religion. The topic that I'm assigned to talk to you this morning is about. Local wisdom and global morality. I will give you the prospect of the development from local wisdom to be a foundation of global morality. In the take the case of Buddhist Buddhism or Buddhist philosophy, how. Buddhism, which started as a local wisdom in it, in India, twenty-five centuries ago, become a world religion and a foundation of global morality. That is the case of other religions like Christianity, which began twenty centuries ago. In Jerusalem, and spread throughout the world, become the the base of global morality. And take the case of philosophy. Greek philosophy began as a local wisdom in Greece twenty centuries ago. No. At that time, people in India or other continent didn't know about Socrates and Plato. But now, Platonic or Platoism is incorporated in Christianity by Saint Augustine and become in harmony with. Christian theology and spread throughout the world, and Greek philosophy at the age of Renaissance has been revived and studied again. The whole world returned to Greek culture, Greek philosophy, which is the foundation of Western thought. All the major branches of philosophy begin as local wisdom. We should learn from them how they succeed in spreading throughout the world, become the influential thought in the whole world. To understand that total picture, 
I would draw your attention to Buddhism as an example. And you can compare with Christianity, with Greek philosophy, and other Western culture. The same thing happens nowadays when Thailand is bombarded by, by Western culture. Hollywood, how it start? Bollywood, how it started? A very small company and succeeded in converting Thai youth into the Western culture with or without morality. That is a matter of concern. We just look back and try to understand the phenomena. Look back to the past happening in order to understand the present situation and predict what is coming in the future. But I don't think that I can accomplish this task in just one hour. So that is left with other uh, speakers and scholars to uh, discuss and elaborate today. So just, I just give you introduction, that's all. First, I would like to draw your attention to uh, uh, the definition of local wisdom so that we can follow the line of thinking in the same way. By local wisdom, we understand as the accumulated knowledge, skills, practice, and beliefs or worldview that are developed and passed down within a specific community or culture. This definition suits the state of Buddhism at the beginning, at its uh, arising period in India or Christianity in, pa in Palestine, in Jerusalem and other Greek philosophy. Because it is a local wisdom, a belief system or worldview. In Thailand, uh, when we use the, uh, the term local wisdom, we incorporate the accumulation of knowledge, skills, practice happening in uh, other fields like uh, architecture, food, herbal medicine, etc. So that is uh, accumulated knowledge of Thai people in the ancient time, passed down to the present day. It become the intellectual property of this land. When I talk of from local wisdom developed into global morality, I mean the belief system, worldview. Worldview and belief system in Thai culture based on Buddhist philosophy or Buddhism. We may have superstitious belief and other things. I will, I will come to that point later on. First, look at Buddhism at the starting period in India as a local wisdom, a very small uh, a, a group of people led by Prince Siddhartha to preach a reform, reform teachings different from the predominant, predominant religion at that time, that is Brahmanism, or now it's Hinduism. So my point here is that philosophy and religion do, do not exist in a vacuum. Please keep in mind. It, it, whether uh, either religion 
or philosophy, neither of them can spring up in vacuum. It means no without inference from the historical event or cultural context at the time. There is a context. We live right now in the histor historical context in the 20th, 20th century. The events in Thailand here and now are different from 200 years ago. The way of thinking of Thai people today are different from what the people 200 years ago or 300 years ago at the time of Ao Chao. Different. Oh. <laughs> so, it spring from the historical and cultural context. That is the context of human knowledge available at that time, culture and society. Take into account this cultural and historical context, we can imagine that when Buddhism first arise of thought by Prince Siddhartha, the context or surrounding event at the moment was a predominant religion, Brahmanism, and competitive culture like the Sikh teachers, Jainism, and others, Samana. So, I would, Buddhism in this case, develop through the interaction with Hinduism. First and foremost, it has to refute some uh, cultural aspect or beliefs in the old religion, like the caste system in Hinduism. In order to grow the pet uh, the rice in the paddy field, you have to cut off or destroy weeds. According to Buddhism, caste system is an obstacle of the Sangha society, which gives value to equality. How can you incorporate the caste system? Kshatriya, Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaisya, and Sutra into Sangha. Recruit them, members of the four castes, and allow them to maintain the old caste system in the Sangha. That would destroy this Sangha. So either you choose this Sangha, the order, or the own system of caste system. So there is a rejection, refutation, before building a new thing. Another, for, another example is the concept of Ataman. Ataman is the permanent, permanent entity inside man related to the all-powerful Ataman, that is Brahman. Paramatman Achivatman. Individual soul and universal soul to use this term. For Buddhism, without God, without supernatural being a Brahman, we have to cut off or reject the existence of that Paramatman or Brahman and assert that there is no Ataman inside man. 
ไฟแอกริเกตส์โนเซลอนัตตา Another point is the critic of ritual and sacrifice like uh, animal sacrifice or human sacrifice I quote from the t r i p i t a k a rejection of the caste system no n a c h a t j a w a s a l o h o t i n a c h a t j a h o t i b r a h m a n o กัมมุนาวัสโลโหติกัมมุนาโหติบรามโน not by birth is one and outcast วัสโล not by birth is one a brahman by deed or karma one becomes an outcast by deed One becomes a Brahman, a holy person, an Arahant, a perfected person. It's possibility for a human being to develop himself to the utmost state of the perfected person that is Arahant, not determined, predetermined by caste system. It is not for me to verify this position. I just talk in past to show that from local wisdom to global morality. That's all. So, at the time of the Buddha, one may doubt whether the Buddha engaged in philosophical discussion or not. Because sometimes when we talk of Buddhism, it confused with with, the, with this philosophy. The four n o m i n truths appear in both Buddhist as religion, Buddhism and religion, and Buddhist philosophy. How we uh, see the difference between Buddhism as religion and Buddhist philosophy? I think the development of Buddhism. Can tell us. First of all, the Buddha himself, as the founder of religion, gained high respect from the followers. The Buddhist, the new Buddhist, or new o r d e n monk, hardly asked the question. Especially metaphysical questions. Take the case of m a l u n g a y a p u t t a that is except ex, uh, that is the exception. Generally, bhikkhu b i k u n i upasaka upasika the four assemblies pay respect to him, follow his instruction. Sila s a m a d i p a n y a precepts meditate. Observe the precepts, meditate, and cultivate wisdom by means of s i k k a or Buddhist education. Not much criticism or questions. It's based on faith, s a t t a For the Buddhists, we have to believe. Or have faith in t a t h a k a t a Bodhisattva. Faith in the enlightenment of the Buddha. k a m m a s a t d a believe in the law of k a m m a etc. Without belief system, it's difficult to practice. Even meditation. At least you have to pay respect to the t r i p l e n gem, to your teachers, master, who teach your meditation. If you keep asking philosophical question, is it possible to meditate? No thought at that moment. 
just observing mental phenomena สติ mindfulness let reality reveal itself by not thinking how contradictory is this in terms of logic it beyond logic machima patibara maybe three values logic in the middle part faith is necessary starting point in the noble eightfold path it begin with samma diddi samma diddi at the beginning is not a wisdom it is just a right belief in the way that we are going to follow up to samma samadhi we choose this way of life to practice It begins with samadhi. If you want to draw anyone to this way of life, give them conviction that this is the right way. It is not a full wisdom. It is just the dawn of wisdom, like Yoni So Manasikara, wise uh, reflection. Why attention? Yoni so manasikara. Yoni so manasikara is the dawn of wisdom, samadhi, and that is related to faith or sattva, and you practice. Okay, that in the Buddhist circle, we saying that we are saying that in the inner circle of the four assembly, uh, you won't find much at the time of the Buddha philosophical discussion. Take the case of Maluka Yaputta. I won't narrate this story. It's quite well known. But Brahmanistic community is was not convinced of the Buddha teaching. They reject. They debate. There is a refutation of the teaching of the two camps. So Brahmachara Sutta, the Sutta on the net of philosophical thinking, sixty of them, narrated by the Buddha, is about philosophical views at the time. When the Buddha has to have dialogues with religious leaders at the time. Philosophical discussion is there. The Sutra, Abhidhamma, record the philosophical discussion. So, if you want to practice meditation to follow the uh, threefold education, threefold training, starting with the Thakata, Podisatta, Samadhi. Not much discussion is there. Philosophical is not there, but some sutra when the Buddha have to encounter with the challenges, the debate from Nikanta, from Brahman, you will see the philosophical discussion. Even his followers sometimes had to defend Buddhist position. So at that time. The conversation between, I mean, dialogue between Buddhism and other religion, give rise to philosophy, Buddhist philosophy, and so the sutta in the and a sutta in the Sutta p i t i k a record the sutra related to this philosophy. Whereas, 200 years after the Buddha passed away. The direct confrontation appear in Abhidhamma, k a t h a v a t u One of the treatises of Abhidhamma, k a t h a v a t u translated as book point of controversies. The debate 
refutation, philosophical position, everything is there. That's why we take a Bidamma in Pali. As the treatise on philosophy and psychology, plenty of philosophical discussions are there, psychological analysis is there. That's why in MCU we are able to set up the department, no, the major subject on Buddhist psychology for a PhD student. Because we have treatises on Buddhist psychology, that is Abhidhamma. And Buddhist philosophy are there in Abhidhamma. Twelve volumes in Abhidhamma. But in Sutra is a record of the event how this philosophy come into the scene because of the interaction between Buddhism and other religions. Another point is after the Buddha passing away, passed away, some fraction or members of the Sangha interpret the Buddha words in different ways from the mainstream led by Mahakasapa, Theravada. So Theravada came, find it necessary to write the proper definition of the Buddha words. What is the meaning of this stanza, this words taught by the Buddha? Attahi attano natho. Our self is a refuge. The self is a re, uh, uh, is a refuge of ourselves. Self here is not atta, not ataman. Commentary has to pinpoint, underline that. Pukkala in a bidama. Pukkala is not a chivataman. Is not a permanent soul. It is just a congregation of uh, a combination of, of five aggregates. But Samnikaya at that time, some sect in Buddhism interpret Pukkara as Chivataman, a permanent self within the five aggregates. So it is it was refuted in Kathavatu, the book of controversy over there. So commentaries is nothing but Buddhist theology. Buddhist theology. What is Buddhist theology? Christian theology. It is in Christianity. Jesus Christ taught the New Testament. Collection of his teaching in the New Testament. To interpret Jesus Christ's teaching, to educate the people at that time, the Christian preacher has to incorporate or adopt philosophical teaching from Greek philosophy, for example, to support the arguments. For example, St. Augustine used the concept of form, the word of form or idea to compare with the rib of God. St. Thomas Aquinas You derive philosophy of Aristotle in Greek philosophy. Make Christianity become very, very rational. God is no longer a personal one, but become the supreme rarity, 
like the world of form in Plato. See how convincing. I would take, I would look at Aquinas and Saint Augustine as commentator who wrote commentary in Buddhist tradition. So Buddha k o s a c h a n is a, co- a great commentator, a writer of comment- commentary. He is a great philosopher, originator of Buddhist philosophy in Theravada. In order to present the different interpretation of points of view from Theravada. We have s a b b a t i k a s a r a v a t i w a k a come into the scene. They wrote their own commentaries in Sanskrit. Become a new nikaya in Buddhism, s a r a v a t i w a d a in Northern India. n a k a r a c h u n a come came into the scene. Great Buddhist philosopher of Mahayana a s u n y a t a He Reject s a r a v a s t i w a d a and present emptiness or shunyata point of view, m a d h y a m i k a the middle part, being what is one extreme, non-being is one extreme. So in the middle, it m a d h y a m i k a He quote from t i b i t a k a s a b b a n g a t i the Buddha say is one extreme. s a b b a n g a t i nothing exists, is another extreme. The Buddha preached by the middle way. i m a s a t i n g i m a s a m i n g s a t i idang hoti. If this exists, that exists. That is p a t i c c a s a m u b a d a See? Nikaya in Buddhism. Arise because of different interpretation, and that is the foundation of Buddhist philosophy. Without studying commentaries, studying nikaya like s a r a v a s i w a d a m a d h y a m i k a of n a k a r a c h u n a y o k a c h a r a y a Zen Buddhism, Zen Buddhism developed from m a d h y a m i k a and y o k a c h a r a You hardly understand Buddhist philosophy. If you just stop at f o r n o m e n t truth, that's all. You will see the lie of development of thought. And another, because they have to, uh, that is, the Vada Mahayana is uh, no doubt is the full development of Buddhist philosophy. How they interact and different from each other. n a k a r a c h u n a and y o k a c h a r a y a m a t h y a m i k a develop the way of thinking how to debate that is form to become a Buddhist logic. Later on, c h e b a s k i uh, wrote a book on Buddhist logic, a beautiful one. It is about b r a h m a n a in Indian philosophy, epistemology, b r a h m a n a Many things to study, many things to do. Left for uh, IBSC <laughs> to do a research. Come to another point. Now you will see that from Buddhism as a religion, a local wisdom in the northern part of India is interact with another. Major religions at the time develop their own thought philosophy, exported out of India to Sri Lanka in the south of Asia, that become Theravada in the north of Asia, not of India, China, Tibet, and uh, Tibet, Korea become Mahayana. They have their own Buddhist philosophies. So develop the uh, they are the full-fledged philosophical thinkings. 
Because of these are the differences that we find. The word Buddhist Sangha Council convened in 1967. Try to find the essential teaching of the Buddha, acceptable to both Theravada, Mahayana, and Mahayana. What would be the basic points unifying the Theravada and Mahayana? They assign to scholars at that time, compile the, the eight points of unity or essential teachings of the Buddha among the different philosophical interpretation, commentary, etc. They find that eight points. Number one is the, 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 the belief Sada in the triple gem, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. The other, like uh, four noble truths, three characteristics of thing, anicang dukkha, anatta, impermanent dukkha, and not self. Noble is four path. That is beside the point. The number eight. Is here. We, the Buddhists, admit that in different countries there are differences in with regard to the ways of life of Buddhist monks, popular Buddhist beliefs and practice, rituals and ceremony, custom and habits. These external forms and expression should not be confused with the essential teachings of the Buddha. Essential teachings are there. Like the uh, the core, the core of a tree, but you have a branch leaves there, which are external component of Buddhism. These external components different in accordance with the lo location where the Buddhism are taught. Buddhism is taught. Thai Buddhism mean essential teaching of Buddha is mixed with the local beliefs, local interpretation. For example, in order to preserve environment to protect the big tree. We have ordination ceremony for the tree, which is unique in Thailand. How the tree is ordained? Wow! Only in Thailand. And pay respect to the tree like you pay respect to the monks, not to cut the tree. And it gives rise right to way of life, to live peacefully with nature, respect for nature, local wisdom, available in Thailand only. <laughs> you can think of other aspects of the Buddha teaching uh, related to Thai clothes. For, uh, for example, Mahave Santra Chataka story, Dana, charity. So, Thailand is the land of smile, Thailand is the land of generosity. Welcome all the tourists with friendship. This spirit of friendship, giving, is uh, emphasized in. Mahachat sermon. See, you won't find this in India. It depends on how that country emphasize. In in Mahayana country in India, you won't find the ten virtues of the king. 
พระทศพิธราชธรรมทศพิธราชธรรม Ten Virtues of the King is not a main teaching in t r i p i t a k a The main teaching in t r i p i t a k a related to the governance is จักรวรรดิวัต The practice of the emperor. Whereas ten virtues of the king is a verse a kata appear in Chataka story, a minor part, k u t a k a n i k a i in the Tripitaka in Sututanta. But it is very influential and powerful in Thailand and other Theravada countries. You can see this is a local wisdom. And from the ten virtues of the king develop into the grand scale of leadership philosophy. How can we contribute to management, study, and governance, good governance, by means of ten virtues of kingship? This very very unique, very specific in Thailand, which which is not no more taught in Cambodia, Laos, or Myanmar, even in Sri Lanka, only in Thailand, because here monarchy is very strong. We don't think we don't want this local wisdom to be lost. How we can share our experience? King j u l a l o n g k o n said that in the absolute monarchy at his time, King he 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 taught his son. King cannot do anything as he like. He cannot kill anyone. He cannot score anyone, hurt anyone without justice. We have to live as a poor person to serve people. In other words, to follow the instruction in ten virtues of the kingship, which appear in Manu Satra, which is a constitution of Thailand during the absolute monarchy. The ten virtues of kingship, t h a t s a p i r a j a t a m was incorporated into. Uh, uh, the t h e s i s called Dhamma s a t the law which governed the behavior of the king at the time. See, this is a local wisdom. We can share them. We can elaborate and taught people nowadays, even in Thailand, how to live with good management and good governance. So this is the Buddhist perspective. I come to another point. Global, just one word. Local wisdom. Now I move to the second one. Global morality. What is global morality? Another part of my presentation. My global global morality is. Uh, global ethics is referred to the framework of ethical principles and values that are meant to apply universally across on individual society culture around the world. The global morality, moral ethic, moral principle should be number one, universal. It had to transcend. Limit of boundary of religions, of society, of culture. It means universally applicable to everyone. What are the rules of conduct in Buddhism that seem to be universal, applicable, applicable to every person in the world? 
ไฟพรีเซปคำทูไมไมส์ to abstain from killing not to kill not to steal not to commit sexual misconduct not to tell lies not to take intoxicants causing h e a t l e s s How is become universal? Just assert that it is universal is not philosophical presentation. See, to convince a t e r that the five precepts are universal morality, you go into the boundary of philosophy. For the Buddhist, it's universal. Non-Buddhist, as a how to convince them? See, so to convince philosopher in the field of philosophy, I have to look into Kantian ethics to compare. I have to talk about Buddhist morality in the language of philosopher. Can beautifully give the framework of universal logic because he lived just 200 years ago. So he can. A lot of experience and knowledge from Greek philosophy, Western philosophy, even religion. So, Kantian ethic is a deontological ethical theory, emphasize on duty, moral principle, and the inherent worth of each individual. What does it mean? The important thing is moral principle, which is similar to five precepts, moral rules of conduct. We have, according to Emmanuel Kant, we have to follow five precepts because it's a universal principle of conduct or morality, and it is not that you are willing to perform. You perform because it is your duty. Duty for duty's sake. And why you take it as a duty? Because you are moral agent, who as a rational being, that is, each individual has his own reason, which is different from Buddhism. Okay. What is similar is moral principle. Is it duty or not? Depends on individual. For Buddhist perspective, but I can take uh, the point related to universality for you. For Immanuel Kant, a moral principle like five precepts. It should be binding on rational beings that is human being, regardless of their desire or personal circumstance. It is uncon unconditional command of reason. Reason command you to follow the five precepts. In Buddhism, reason here is wisdom. Only a person full of wisdom, p a n y a can find it easier. To follow the five precepts, otherwise there is a distraction from k i l e s a defilements. So the difference from uh, between Buddhist position and Kantian ethic is about the autonomy of the agent, moral agent, the person. But how can we solve this difference? Is another matter. The matter is about universal law of conduct to become a global morality. That is very interesting. When you compare, you have to see the similarity and the difference.
Similarity is universality of the precepts. Different is autonomy of the agent or the unconditioned command of reason. For Kant, it is not necessary to develop reason, rational, in, uh, rational rationality in your mind because it's already there. Like uh, in Plato form, idea, knowledge, liberation is there. I think it's influenced by other Greek philosophers. Education is nothing for Plato. It's a revelation of what you already have in your mind, which is similar to Mahayana, uh, Bodhicitta, the enlightenment, the Buddha mind. See, you will see the similarity in everywhere. So, from Plato to Kant, we are born with knowledge, with wisdom, but it is hidden. That is taught by Socrates and Plato. But Kant said that it is a priori. It is categories in your mind. Like mathematics, it's already there. So Kant looked at ethics as like a, something, a framework of mind, like mathematics. Everyone has reason to follow. 2 plus 2 equal 4. Not to steal something. We have to do it. Not to kill. So he formed three formulae. Num the first formula for universal law is this. Act only in uh, according to that maxim by which you can, at the same time, view that it should become a universal law. Whatever rules of conduct that you follow, you have to, you must look at that rules of conduct, like not to kill, as a universal law, applicable to every human being. How? First, it should be a contradiction. If we say that we should kill everyone, this law cannot be sustainable because if every member of human beings kill each other, there will be no human being to observe the law. If we say that we should steal, so every day everybody is free to steal from the university, corruption, no university left. This law is not applicable. It's self-destructive. If everyone is free to tell lies, how can communication possible when you think that he or she lies to me all the time. So this precept is meaningless. Not to kill it itself a universal in the sense that it's applicable to everyone and at the same time it preserves itself as a law. This is number one. If you say that to kill the outcast people is good. The other will do the same thing to you. So the golden rule that all religions follow is do unto the other what you want them to do to you applicable to everyone. Golden rule. Five precepts. But some would say, okay, first four precepts, 
not to kill, not to steal, not to tell, uh, not to have sexual misconduct, not to tell lies, are universal. What about intoxicants taking or drug abuse? I do not harm others. This is a challenge from your followers, the Buddhists, who want to drink every day. Mitchatiti people. <laughs> and they have all their own logic. It's not follow from the first formula. Come to the second one and you will see. Act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, always at the same time as an end and never merely as a means to an end. That means you have to respect the right of other people and the right of yourself. The right of yourself to live, that is your own person, to live happily, long life. Don't take drugs over even intoxicant to harm your own self is against you use your body as the means to an end at its temporary happiness as you think. What and if you spend a lot of money for drugs you take the money of your son, your daughter, education, your family for your own, your own temporary enjoyment. You take your family member as means to your happiness, pleasure, I can say. So in ethics, you have to take everyone equal to you. Look at them and treat them at the end. Pay respect to their rights, right to happiness, right to education, right to development. Not to take for granted the other people. Ethics, if you steal, from someone. It means one has to work hard to collect money and you take money out of them. They are means for your pressure. You tell lie. Tell lies so that you can steal because you are from the call center. Phone call every day and steal the money from their bank. You take other as means. You pretend to be their lovers. Give me money. See? Add means. No respect. And the five precepts want us to respect other as in. Not only people, even animals. When you use buffalo in plowing the field. After finishing your job, you kill the buffalo. No. But otherwise, it is just the means to your end. Respect the rights of the buffalo. Not to kill. See? To protect nature. Come to nature. Stealing from your young generation to come. Future generation. You cut the trees. Sell the on the treasure in your land. Pollute water. Polluted water. Never care about the future generation. Your son, grandsons. You're stealing them the right to live happily with nature. You treat other people as a means. See? I 
and number three act only so that your view can be regarded at the same time as making universal law through its maxims quite difficult but i just explained in a simple language that it means for kant man is a rational being so he act with reason and he his view is a free will which guided by reason and he think that other people will do the same thing so his five precepts when applicable to every rational being it means i am good the other will be good also so the when the innocent children have trust in a stranger because this uh, kind of comparison I, I would like to show you the, the quotation of Tipitaka. Um, no. Okay, later on. Uh, this one. When you, uh, you think that you are good and you have trust in the people to be good, that, that is this formula because everyone is rational being. But the thing uh, is that in Buddhism there is a saying, everybody is afraid of death. Life is dear to a person. Atanang upamang kattawa compare oneself with other like this one should not kill or cause to kill one should not harm or cause to harm Atanang upamang katawa compare yourself with others this is the law if we love our life the other should love their lives take them at end in themselves not to steal them, not to kill them, to follow five precepts. So the five, and your life is loved by yourself, not to take drugs or intoxicants. The same thing. So that you won't be a drunk driver to kill other people on street, on the road. See? To care other people, you will observe the five precepts. That is one aspect of moral issue. But the difference from, uh, of, uh, between Kantian ethics and Buddhism is that in Buddhism, man is not always rational because his rational, that is wisdom, is clouded by kilesa, greed, hatred, and uh, Ignorance, delusion. So it's up to us to have mental development by means of meditation, by practice meditation, mindfulness to, cal to purify the mind. That's why the, the Buddhist teaching related to Buddhist training, Sira Samadhi Panya, coming to the scene. I, I, I don't have time to explain that later. But let's come to the, set, the last point of global morality. Global morality not only become universal in nature, but also it added issues that transcend national, cultural, religious boundary, focusing on the shared responsibility and rights of humanity as a whole. You see, we come from different culture, local wisdom, uh, different religion, faith. But the world is facing with global warming. We have to forget our difference and contribute the wisdom from our local, lo locality to solve the world problems. Right now, there is a conflict in the world. 
It is not up to one country or one local wisdom to face these difficulties. We have to join hand to work together by force, by moral force, from all section, all sector, become not a hard power but soft power. To say no to war in Ukraine, in Gaza Strip, and anywhere in the world. Not enough for any local wisdom to voice their concern. Every voice should come out and speak out. Moral authority. So morality of the lo local religion, local wisdom become universal and global because it challenge the world problems. Global warming, climate change, you see now, is a, a world problem. So in that case, I take the case of FDG. To move the world towards the development without problems, we have to adopt local wisdom from by any means anywhere to achieve the 17 goals. Peace is there somewhere. Yeah. So 17 goals can be summarized into three dimensions, three groups, social, environment, and economic how moral local wisdom in Thailand related to environment help solve the world problem relating to climate change. How Buddhist wisdom in our local success applicable to, to social conflict or the applicable application of Sustainable, no, self-sufficiency economy proposed by King Lama the Ninth, former kings. With rooted, which, which was rooted in Buddhist wisdom. Applicable to solve economic crisis in the world. In Bhutan, they are doing the same thing. Cross domestic happiness. GNH based on Buddhist wisdom. It's a local because it's in Bhutan. How GNH cross national happiness there helps solve the economic crisis anywhere, elsewhere in the world. How sufficiency economy proposed by King Pumipon again, adopted and applicable to solve economic crisis anyway. We have to make it known and we, uh, at the bottom you have peace. People, right, take people not as means but end in themselves. Respect them. Follow five precepts. Plus economic prosperity, Buddhist economics, like a sufficiency economy, and preserve environment, planet, taking care of benefit and happiness of future generation, not take few uh, natural resources as means, but end in themselves to preserve it with compassion. Wisdom and compassion. And we form partnership with all wisdom on in Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, and philosophical circles. Hand in hand, we go together. And at the bottom, P 
peace must be there. Without peace, we cannot have, we cannot preserve the right of the people. We cannot cannot have economic prosperity. We cannot preserve environmental uh, planet. So everything had to be taken care of by partnership. Peace is the foundation. Nati, I end. I talk with this. Nati Santi Parang Sukang. Peace is the greatest happiness. Foundation of moral, a uh, global morality. This is peace. Thank you very much. <laughs>